I wonder if you know what is the most common word used to designate Christians, believers in Jesus, the born-again people, the flock of God. What is the most common word used in the New Testament for that for those people? Got a guess? It's not Christian, the word we use the most, I guess. In fact, the word Christian is barely used at all in the New Testament, though it's a perfectly good word, and it is in there. It's found in the book of Acts where we're told this is the first place where they called these people Christians. And then pretty much it's not mentioned again. <laughs> Do you know what the most common word is to refer to someone who belongs to Jesus? The word is brother. Brother, sibling, brother slash sister. I like the way Papimento does this. We just have one word for both brothers and sisters. And in fact, in the ancient Greek language of the New Testament, there's really just one word with a different ending on it so that it becomes either masculine or feminine. Brother. Well, that should tell you something. If you... Uh, Look at 1 John chapter 3. There's the most amazing thing stated. And because we're used to it, we don't often notice that it's that amazing. But here's the way John starts when he's going to tell us this fact. He says, behold. And if you could say it like that when you're writing, that's how it would be said. Behold, look, you're not going to believe this. Look at this. Behold, what kind of love the Father has given to us. Well, we would all acknowledge right away that the love the Father has given to us is something to behold. It is ridiculous and amazing, overwhelming, this love. But do you know what John points out to us here about this love? What's amazing about this love we have from God? Well, behold, what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. That's how we should react. When we hear, child of God, we should go, what? We don't do that because we are braggadocious, if I could use that word, and we just like to think that, of course, we're sort of entitled to be children of God. John doesn't feel that way. John is amazed by this fact. He says, behold, what kind of love is this that we would be called children of God? It's crazy, this love, this love under which God regards us as his own children. I'm just trying to get us amazed by that fact again because we're so used to it, we, are no, we quit being amazed by it. But it is amazing that we would be called children of God. And then he says, and so we are. It's true, believe it or not. What kind of love the Father has given that we would be called His children? The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now, already. 
And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is and everyone who thus hopes in Christ purifies himself as Christ is pure. Children of God. We could look at uh, Romans chapter 8 where we are told that because the Spirit of God God, the Spirit of Christ Himself, lives in the believer, that that person is entitled to address God as Abba, Father. We could read a similar thing in Galatians chapter 4, where the Spirit given to us, in us, the Spirit in us cries, Abba, Father. From us, the Spirit speaks, to God and addresses Him as Father. We could read in John chapter 1, verse 12, as many as received Him, to them He gave the right, the authority, the mandate, the privilege to be called children of God. Then we read that text in Hebrews chapter 2, just a moment ago, where Jesus becomes one of us. Jesus partakes of flesh and blood, fully man, and gives himself a sacrifice for us to redeem us from our sinful condition. And it says, he is therefore not ashamed to call us brother. That is not a fact we should get used to. That is astounding. The eternal Son of God, the ever-living second person of the triune God, made flesh, calls me his brother and is not embarrassed as he ought to be. What a crazy love it is that we should be called children of God. That the church, the body of Christ, can be called the family of God. When I was in seminary, we, uh, we talked about these various metaphors, they called them. Metaphors for the church, the assembly of God's people the body of Christ, the flock of God, the, sorry, I'm only going to think of these three, the family of God. And I thought to myself, metaphors, the, the Scripture doesn't say we're sort of like a family or that you could use the idea of a family to think about us No, it says we are actually adopted by God. That the Lord Jesus, the eternal Son, the God-made flesh human being, refers to us as brothers. It's not just a metaphor. It's the actual reality of things. And it is a restoration of the family of man the image-bearing family of man as God intended when He made us in the first place. We all descend from one couple. What do you call that? A family. And in Christ, we are reunited into a single family, the family of God, the household of faith. So I want to ask this question, if that's true, so what? What difference does it make, or what difference should it make that the Bible identifies the church as a family and not as a club, which is how we tend to take it? It's not a club we join. Oh, and it's not a company we work for which is another way people tend to relate to it. It's a family. 
It's a family. I think right off the bat when I think about that, I think, oh, it's not something I go to. It's where I'm from. <laughs> I don't, when I, I don't, at the end of the day, go to my family. At the beginning of the day, I come from there. That's where my identity is. That's where I belong. So right off the bat, I think, oh, this is where I'm from. It's not just something I attend. It's not a club. It's not a company. It's a family. This made me think, well, what constitutes a good family? You know, because sometimes when I ta start talking like this about the church as a family, there's people listening to me in this room, perhaps, that think, oh, gross. Uh, you know, really, because people, many people, come from families and you don't get to pick, do you? Some families are horrible. Some families do not function well. We call them dysfunctional. And the consequences of dysfunctional family are rampant in the society. So we want to think about, if we're going to think about family, the family of God, and that we are one, we want to think about what is a good family. What sort of family would God have? And what sort of family is an effective family? You know, it turns out people study this. There's a whole bank of academic literature on, this, on strong family life. It's actually well studied. They could tell you all about it. I know this because I went and read some of this stuff. And when they boil it down, this is what they say. When they say, here's what constitutes a strong family. Strong families develop strong connections. Effective families are families that develop strong connections. Well, we have a word for that from the Bible. That word is fellowship. Strong families have really strong fellowship, relationships, Now, when they study this stuff, they figure out that these strong families that develop strong connections also build up individuals who have confidence and skill to develop strong relationships. They develop relationally healthy people. A relational, well, this just makes sense, right? If I, if I put two children up here and I said, this one is going to grow up in a family where he is assured of the fact that in his family he is unconditionally loved, and this child is not. We would not have a lot of trouble predicting the outcome of these two lives. We know that if I grow up in a family where strong ties are built that I'm strongly connected to, that I develop the ability to develop strong connections. And if I don't grow up in that sort of family, I'm hampered in those skills. Now they go further, these 
psychologists and sociologists when they talk about strong families, and they, they notice that these strong connections go three different directions. They studied this in modern secular academics, and they notice that the best families all have faith. They tend to be the religious families. Now, of course, you can be religious in a horrible, dysfunctional way in your family. But strong families have a relationship with God. They develop strong connections in an upward direction. Then they develop strong connections in an inward direction. They really actually love one another. So that the people in that group, that little family, those people know and have confidence and can trust the love of their family. They know that even if they screw up in the most horrible way, that group of people will still have them. They will not be rejected. In fact, they grow up with the confidence that, they, that that group of people is incapable of rejecting them. They have unconditional acceptance in that group. They love one another if we want to use the commandments of Jesus. Jesus said the first commandment is to love the Lord your God. Then he said the new commandment is that you love one another as I have loved you. And then the second commandment after love the Lord your God is love your neighbor as yourself. So they develop strong connections upwardly, inwardly, and outwardly. The people who grow up in strong families are good in society. They love their neighbors. They have an abundance and they know how to share it. Now, there's a lot of study that goes into how do these families do this and I, I put a list. I guess I don't want to dwell too long on this list. Effective families have clear roles. Everyone in the family knows who they are in that family, and they're not all the same. They each do different things, and of course, these roles can shuffle around over time, but they, er, there's a clear understanding of their roles. There's a clear a clarity of communication, and when we say clear communication, we mean the people in the family, in an effective family, they don't wonder what the other people are thinking. There's a, there's a clarity of communication and there's a understanding. Now, we're describing an, an ideal here, of course. So, even in the best families, this sometimes isn't what actually occurs. But uh, this clear communication also includes a sort of emotional honesty. And because I'm encased in this unconditional acceptance, I can share my actual feelings without anxiety. Clear communication, clear affection clear affection. There's within uh, uh, effective family, there's loving discipline. So it's not like we just let you act like a fool. There's a, a disciplinary function in the family that, that corrects for the benefit of the one corrected. Now, this is hard for many Families, parents especially, they have a hard time correcting for the benefit of the corrected. But that's, that's your goal, moms and dads. You don't correct your child so that you will have a more peaceful world. But 
for the benefit of your child, and we're all going to get a more peaceful world out of it. There's, in uh, effective families, there's, a, uh, there's tradition. There's the way we do it. There's the way, we just had the Christmas holidays, and I had several conversations with people about the Christmas traditions in their families. Every family, it seems, has a little tweak on what, how they do Christmas. That's really good. There's a way we do it that we know, that we identify with, that makes us us. But in this tradition, there's also flexibility. In fact, you know what I would observe? It's only when you have a tradition that you can be flexible. If you just wander all over the place all the time, well, that's not flexible, that's wandering. Uh, effective families have unity, but also they have autonomy. In other words, they respect the individual dignity of each human being in the group. And yet, they are a group. They have a we identity and they have a me identity. I am myself, but I am a member of the Henry Searle family. My sister had a birthday yesterday. And my other sister posted a picture of us when I was, I think, like four years old. So it's all these cute little kids around my parents who look like kids to me in this picture. And it just, it's like, uh, you know, there's five of us. My little sister's a little baby in this picture. She's, well, I can't tell you how old she is now. But there's an identity in our family. We were, we were a, a marine aviator family. We have all these little things that, I, that make us a thing. And I, I was with my family, as you know, this summer when my nephew was lost to us. And I remember having this conversation with one of my niece's children about how we don't really see each other that much, but as soon as I'm in the same room with my brothers and sisters, it's like we were together yesterday. There's unity and autonomy. Now, I'm not talking to you this morning because I want you to be good families, though that is the case. I do want you to be good families. And there's some really good counsel in these studies about how you might behave together in order to be a good family. But really, I wanted to talk about this because we are embarking in the next few weeks on a discussion of the family from the book of Ephesians, which flows out of the discussion of the church as the family. And it occurs to me that if I wanted to make a New Year's resolution, that resolution would be that this church exhibits the family reality. That we would grow as a family in the family of God. That that identifying fellowship would be true about this body of Christians. Now, some of you are from other bodies of Christians, but I think that's a pretty good goal for yours, too. Because this is one of the central ideas of the meaning and significance of the church in the New Testament. As I mentioned, when the Bible wants to say Christian, it says brother. So what if we, as a church, 
take this seriously. Not just as an emblem, but as a reality. What if we said to ourselves, what if it's true? What if it's true? Well, I think if we did that, we would prioritize fellowship. We would prioritize fellowship. It's about how we share life together. It's about how we are connected to each other. It's about how we find and fill our individual roles. It's about how we open up and communicate. And at the same time, communicate unconditional acceptance so that whatever you say does not lead to me rejecting you. That you might have the freedom to really be uh, idiotic. You know, I have a little brother, so I know all about that. Sorry, Matt, if you're watching. He's way less idiotic now than he used to be. It's about how we communicate that acceptance. I, when I mentioned my little brother, I, I remember this occasion when uh, I was looking out the window of the house we were living in at the time, and there was my little brother across the street, and he was in a fight with this other kid. And I don't believe I've ever moved as fast as I moved when I noticed that. It was like I was out there in a second. I can beat up my little brother, but you better not lay a hand on him. <laughs> there's, a, there's a communication of unconditional connection. If we take this seriously, we learn to show affection. And for some of us, that is harder than for others. And so we learn to be patient, give people space. We sometimes have to communicate correction. We form traditions. We have a way. We share an identity as a local body of Christ. And this changes things, I think. Could. If we're a family and not a club and not a company, it changes our approach to evangelism and growth as a church. How do we grow as a church? The Father adopts more people and puts them with us. That's how. So what do we do? Well, we exhibit the Word. And I'm using that phrase, or that word exhibit on purpose. Because to exhibit the Word includes saying it and demonstrating it. If the word is fellowship, if the word is reconciliation by the blood of Christ to the living God and to each other, if we are friends and brothers in Christ, that's a thing that shows in the way we live. But it also needs to be described and said and stated. So we exhibit the word and we see who responds in faith. His sheep hear his voice and follow him. So if we're out there announcing the voice of Jesus, some people we run into are going to hear it. We invite our friends over to the house. A lot. 
You know that house, right? You probably had one in your neighborhood as you were a kid. Maybe you were in that house, that house that everyone was always invited to. That should be this house. We invite our friends over to the house a lot. So we want it to be a pretty nice house, but not too nice. We want it to be a welcoming house, a friendly house. We think anyone could be adopted into our family at any moment. <laughs> now, this is unusual, isn't it? Anyone could be adopted into our family at any moment. So we need a family that's strong enough that anyone could join it and not wreck it. We need the assurance of faith and grace. We need, as Hebrews puts it, to draw near whole and hold fast to the confession of our faith, to get it nailed down so that someone who's new, who's adopted into the family and has all kinds of ridiculous ideas won't distract the rest of us from the goodness of God in Christ. But that over time, our understanding and appreciation, our deep understanding and appreciation of the goodness of God in Christ will overwhelm all the ridiculous beliefs. We want to be able to welcome and include anyone. If we're a family, it changes our approach to evangelism and the growth of the church. If we're a family, it changes our approach to our own individual spiritual growth. It changes the terms of our growth from the usual understanding, which is you know more and you're more well-behaved. This is the normal understanding of Christian growth, knowledge and obedience. So we evaluate you, and we all do this to every, all the rest of us. Each one of us, we look at you and we say, Are you, do you know more than you used to know, and do you behave better than you used to behave? And that's our, those are our terms of growth. Well, those things are certainly good and important ingredients to our growth, but they are not the things that the Bible describes as growth in the life of a Christian. The Bible says we grow in grace by faith. That what we grow in is we trust in the goodness and obedience of Christ better or more or stronger than we did yesterday. It's a relationship. And if we think about the church as a family, as a fellowship, then what is the real definition of growth? It changes from are you smarter and more well-behaved to Are you more capable in the development of loving connections with others in Christ? Now, I think that knowledge and obedience are part of that, but they're not the thing itself. The thing itself is the fellowship and the strength of it. So, this changes our idea of spiritual growth to be about the fellowship. It's personal. It's not a program. It's not counting how many verses you've memorized. Though, if you memorize some verses, you will be better at this. It's engaging in relationships up, in, and out. It's, it's skipping ahead to the fellowship. To the point, also, it's all in grace. 
So it is an opportunity, not a demand. You know, if you're part of the family and you're lazy, well, you're going to frustrate us. But you're still part of the family. We, your acceptance, especially your acceptance before God Almighty, and if He accepts you, I'm certainly not in a position to reject you. If He accepts you, if He's forgiven you, then whatever dumb thing you did to me yesterday is certainly no big deal. And so I accept you. And so, but this is an opportunity. This is something we get to do, not something God demands of you. When you came to Christ, God quit demanding. All the demands of God are met in and through and by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And you get credit for it, even though you are really horrible at doing it yourself. This is grace. This is what we trust. And what this does is it turns my heart upside down. And so now, because I have credit for Christ's own righteousness, I want to exhibit Christ's own righteousness. It's not something imposed on me. It's what I want. And I know now that I would be foolish, crazy even, to want anything else. If I understand the Lord's will... Well, uh, what would I substitute for that? <laughs> Any substitute for that is insane. And now I see it because the love of God has been poured out in my heart by the Spirit. This fellowship, this family life, this spiritual growth is not measured by knowledge and obedience but it is built up by employing them. So it's not like, okay, well, never mind studying the doctrines of Scripture. No. This fellowship is strengthened by a clear understanding and a deep, rich understanding of the doctrines of the Christian faith in the Scriptures. If we're a family, it also changes our approach to serving in the church. Everyone has a place. Everyone. Everyone. Doesn't matter how old you are. Doesn't matter what gender you are. Doesn't matter what language you speak. Doesn't matter what country you're from. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. In Christ, the Scripture says these distinctions are nearly evaporated. Now, some of these things have an impact on what roles a person might take. I, we are probably not going to get the two-year-old to teach the adult Sunday school class on the atonement. The fact that it's a two-year-old has an impact on what his or her role might be. But everyone has a place. For some period of time, my place is to sit and soak. For some people, my pl their place is simply to pray and pay attention to the people around. Every one of us, when we come through the door, we can come through with a scowl or a smile. And if we feel like scowling, all right. The rest of us will minister to you. Because this is a family. And when we come in here on Sunday morning, we're coming back to the house. This is where we belong. And this is where you will belong 
no matter what. Everybody has a place. We honor the character and the preferences of each family member. So we're a thing, but so are you. And the, the Scripture says that God places each believer into the body according to his own will. So when God put you in some particular church, that was not an accident. And it wasn't just because your job sent you someplace. And it wasn't because you found a place, though you might have. But what God is doing when he puts any one of us in any place, in any church, is he's bringing something to that group. That is a provision of God. We often come through the door of a church asking this question, what can you, this church, do for me and my family? Well, that's the actual opposite of the right question. The right question is, what has God brought me here for? What does this church need that God is providing by bringing me here? And there is something. There is something. Also, in our service in the church, the focus is not on getting stuff done. Our various programs and projects. The focus is on strengthening and extending the fellowship of God in Christ. Sometimes we might develop a program that will assist us in doing so. Here's what we don't want to do. We don't want the program to displace the fellowship. If we are in a situation where we've got two people in, working in a program and they're fighting with each other about what the best way to run this program is, something has gone wrong. It's not about the program. And here's the thing about programs. They tend to take over. Why do you do that? Well, we always have. We, and we like traditions, but we don't like traditions that have no meaning. And we don't want to keep on doing something when it's no longer making a positive contribution to the strengthening of our connections in the body of Christ. Or equipping people to be strong connectors. So it changes the focus of our approach in serving in the church and it changes finally our approach to the unity of the body. Here's my conviction. The unity of the body of Christ is experienced in the body of Christ. In the local church, the whole body of Christ, every believer everywhere all over the world is one body. And we are brothers and sisters of every Christian everywhere. But I know you. And this local organization, this little band of elders serving to shepherd some small group of believers in a particular place, is the biblical design. And it is designed for, to be the expression of the unity of the whole thing in the little one, in the local family. I have cousins I have cousins, a lot of them actually. Some of them I barely know. Some of them we were pretty good friends, especially when we were kids, and even today I'd be pretty good friends with them, and they're in my family. 
but they're not in my family like my brothers are in my family and my sisters are in my family and my parents are in my family and their kids are in my family. It's a whole different kind of thing. And what we experience in the local family is the biggest deal. And the right place, the best place to realize the unity that is true of the whole family is in the little family. Where we serve and grow together in direct contact under a particular set of leaders. This also gives a lot of freedom in the local, local churches are different. This church is not the same as the other churches here in Bonaire. It has a particular character, a particular buildup of people. It has a particular way. It's not the same as some others. And okay, God puts us wherever he needs us. That's good. That's fine. I, I kind of look at it like this. Our house is built for us. But mi casa es su casa. Anyone's welcome. Come on over. We'd love to have you. And whether you're a member of the big family or not, no problem. What's going on here is the unity of the body of Christ in one little group. This is my prayer as we uh, embark on this new year, that this church would exhibit this priority. Because, not because I just like this priority, but because this is the biblical priority. This is the thing, according to Scripture, the thing, love God, love your neighbor. It's about the fellowship. It's always been about the fellowship from the very beginning. God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let him multiply and fill the earth. He's filling it with a single family. And this family extends the image of God to every point on the planet. It's always been about fellowship. The very fact of the matter is we, there's a Trinity God. And the world that that God has made is a fellowshipping world. And that is exactly what we broke when we turned against Him. And in Christ, that is exactly what He is restoring. So my prayer for this church is, this church knows reconciliation in Christ and exhibits rich fellowship with God, with each other, and with the world around us. Father, thank you for this amazing privilege. Lord, it's only possible by the ministry of your Spirit by faith in your Son, by drawing near, holding fast, encouraging one another. That is what we ask for, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.